Right. Hello, my name is Rose Spickler. I'm the membership manager of the Lakeshore Sustainability Forum and the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event. For those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, the Lakeshore Sustainability Forum is a regional program of the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. We serve as a platform to connect and collaborate on sustainability interests and highlight its potential as an economic driver and a defining feature of the Lakeshore as an economy and as a destination. We do this by providing education, resources, and collaboration opportunities to businesses, individuals, and institutions throughout the Lakeshore region. Today, we're very excited to present a webinar on the future of energy and water utilities in Green Haven, highlighting current and pending inv investments <clears throat> excuse me, in drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater management and ge energy generation. We'd really like to thank the Grand Haven Area Community Foundation and the Community Foundation for Muskegon County for their partnerships in developing and hosting this event. If you find this program valuable, I hope you will join us for some of our upcoming online discussions. Our next event will be on February 8th at noon and will highlight modern day sustainable solar development with speakers from Innovata Solar and Michigan Energy Options. A link for the registration for this event will be available in the chat as well as in an email that is sent out with the recording of this program. In addition to our educational events, the Lakeshore Sustainability Forum hosts two public subcommittees, one focused on industry and business on the Lakeshore, and one focused on sustainability and equity on the Lakeshore. If you're interested in joining either committee, please email us. We'll put more information for contacting us in the chat. You'll also receive a link to a video of today's program with a feedback survey, along with any additional notes that come out of today's program in an email following this webinar. Um, this series and all of our programs are primarily funded through membership donations. If you're not yet a member of our organization, please consider becoming one. We offer individual student and corporate memberships and more information. Um, I'll put a link in the chat for that as well. Um, so that'll be found um, on our website. I'd really like to recognize some of our new corporate members, including SIPSI, Furthered, Pure Architects, Graphic Packaging International, and Outdoor Discovery Network. So now on to our main discussion for the day. Um, thank you again for joining us on our webinar on the future of energy and water in Green Haven. I have the privilege of introducing our presenters today. Derek Gatos, a Director of Public Works for the City of Green Haven, and David Walters, General Manager um, for the Green Haven Board of Light and Power. Thank you both for joining us today. For our attendees, please note that you can share your thoughts with the panelists or at all, all attendees through the chat function. Um, you can also ask questions through the question and answer field. We'll have time at the end of the conversation for open question and answers. Now I'll pass it along to Derek Gatos to discuss the water, wastewater, and stormwater utilities in Green Haven. Derek, the screen is yours. Great, thank you, thank you, Rose. I'm gonna um, going to uh, focus in on our water supply. Uh, uh, today um, and uh, talk about uh, sustainable water supplies uh, in an abund abundant environment. Um, we are so lucky to, um, to, to live uh, next to Lake Michigan and have this amazing water supply. Now there, that's not uh, the case around uh, our country or even around the world, um, but we're so lucky to have it. We enjoy it recreationally as well, um, but we also use it for our, um, our you know, drinking water supplies. And so why do we, why do we need to talk about it when it's so abundant. <clears throat> well, our use of it um, has environmental impacts. Um, it also has financial impacts uh, for those um, uh, those that use it and are connected to it. Um, and our societal impacts as well. The um, the uh, the not uh, safe, clean drinking water isn't available everywhere you know in our country in this world. Um, and uh, to to have that uh, uh, ready at our tap at just the flip of a faucet. Um, creates a, the society that we've we've developed over the last couple hundred years, um, and uh, and without it, um, creates a, a huge um, concern for our safety and their health. Um, and it has legacy impacts. What are we going to do for the future? Um, that body of water will be there, hopefully for forever, um, but will it always be usable? Um, so there's some legacy impacts. Um, what is the problem then? Well, uh, currently, in, uh, the city owns and operates uh, what we what we uh, name as the North Auto Water uh, System f uh, Filtration Plant. It's located in the city, um, and it draws water out of Lake Michigan. And um, uh, that plant is rated at like a 23 million gallon a day plant. It's one of the smaller ones along Lake Shore. We we supply water to uh, 
to five other small communities in the Tri-Cities. Um, total population approaching 50,000. Um, so we're nowhere close to uh, the uh, capacities that are neighboring communities in West Michigan, Grand Rapids, and the city of Wyoming and Muskegon um, that they can produce. But the but uh, but we have a real problem just uh, as an as an industry um, with uh, the abundant supply, but yet um, uh, the production demands that we uh, use in our in our society. So currently, um, out of the North Outer Water Plant, we use approximately twenty five percent of of the plant's capacity to meet our domestic water pro or domestic uh, um, uh, needs. And um, for our, our community, it's about four to six million um, gallons a day. Um, however, our irrigation demands add an additional 60 to 75% uh, to those requirements or 10 to 20 million gallons a day. So we, we water or irrigate um, you know, our lawns and our uh, landscaping at a significant rate. And why does uh, why does that matter? Um, we'll get to that. But those those costing uh, the cost to increase capacity is estimated to cost our our uh, estimated to increase our monthly uh, bills anywhere from twenty five to fifty percent just at the uh, facility, um, and those rates uh, are approaching and have exceeded affordability um, uh, to the low income populations in our country. We see that in areas um, like Flint, um, where you know the cost to use and deliver that water um, is is uh, is being is very hard for our for um, our low income populations to just just uh, um, use. Um, last year in 2020, we hit we hit a milestone um, where our North Auto Water System uh, issued its first irrigation restrictions in 17 years. Um, 17 years ago uh, in 2003. Uh, the North Ottawa Water System were purchased its last uh, fifth in Muskegon County. Um, uh, and, and that was due to uh, a system plant expansion. At that time, the population had reached uh, such, and our irrigation demands had reached uh, such a level that uh, the plant needed to be expanded. And that was actually uh, started in the, in the mid 90s. And by, by early 2000, it was completed um, and operational. So for 17 years, we've been, we've been good. We've been just producing water and selling it and at a, a vast uh, amount uh, in the summertime for irrigation. Um, last year, also the city of Wyoming uh, filtration plant issued a sprinkler ban for 10 days um, that, uh, that uh, caused, uh, was, was caused by a water main failure. And had that water main failure actually uh, happened during the winter time um, or an off peak time, um, there would have been no ban. So we, we know that directly, uh, that ban was directly um, influenced by our irrigation needs. And, um, and that all, uh, uh, those impacts have, uh, can have a great deal um, of consequences if we were to, um, to exceed those, uh, the, the demands of the plant, or the demands exceed the, the capacity of the plant. Um, if you think about the, um, when our water systems uh, de pressurize or um, um, exceed capacity, you know, our hospitals uh, have to go into emergency water use uh, uh, scenarios. Our schools need to close um, and, and so do our restaurants. And now we've been, we've been experiencing what a restaurant looks like uh, um, closure, but um, uh, what those look like. But, you know, in, in normal times, we, uh, we, you know, we wouldn't want a restaurant um, and, and those a great financial impact on those. Um, but it also affects availability, just, just basic domestic water use um, is, is threatened as well. Um, so how do we address it? Well, um, we got to reimagine our water use. We can't just live the way we're living um, in West Michigan. There's, there's areas of the country that have addressed it. Um, and 20 to 30 years ago, um, you know, what we're experiencing or starting to experience now was experienced out in the, the Southwest. Um, there were there were major plans to bring water, um, you know, from the Great Lakes to uh, to the to the Nevada, and uh, or even or even I, I remember some of the the crazy ideas of floating icebergs down for for water supply. Waters was in, in great need, and and they didn't get the water supply change that they were looking for. Um, no, they didn't build a pipeline from Lake Michigan over over to uh, Las Vegas. Um, they had to reimagine what the water use looked like. So they, they developed 
alternatives to what they were used to living. So that took a lot of planning. And, you know, 20 or 30 years later, as that stuff, uh, those plans are implemented, you know, they took a great time uh, to, to educate the public. Uh, they, they had uh, landscaping uh, restrictions um, that uh, helped, uh, you know, mitigate uh, those, those water use um, issues. Um, and then they empowered uh, the people to the landscapers, um, local jurisdictions that had, that had requirements. Um, uh, the city of Grand Haven has a requirement that uh, you need um, um, a vegetation in your front lawn, um, and uh, uh, at least in the parkway. And so can we change those? Can we empower people to do alternative things? Um, and then that comes to, to, uh, to, to legislation as far as, uh, you know, how do we legislate that? Um, there's there's uh, places in the country that have uh, tiered water use um, costs, and so we can do it that way. We can we can open up the idea um, legislation books to to allow different things to, um, to be used um, in our in our um, planning and uh, building. Um, and the last thing is just we need to take action. We need to start doing something because it's going to be a long a long haul um, to to uh, uh, turn this train around. Our culture and our society here in West Michigan with this abundant source we're sitting right next to, the problem is, is we're using domestic water, uh, stuff that was designed to drink um, to, to make our houses and our, and our communities look, look beautiful. And, um, you know, with that said, we can, um, uh, we can continue to do that. It's just at a, such a cost. You know, one thing that we, uh, a lot of people would say, well, what about, uh, what about taking the water out of the ground? What about groundwater? And we'll just irrigate with that. Um, well, our local groundwater supplies are also affected. And I'm not going to um, be the, the person to tell you all the details, but Iowa County's done a great job um, with a couple studies in the, in the past decade um, that, that shows our water, uh, groundwater use. Iowa County um, regulates all of the wells in the county. Uh, the city of Grand Haven does not. Um, we do have some restrictions on, on some groundwater um, wells and contamination areas, but in general, the county does that, does a great job at it, and they're seeing, um, you know, our groundwater supplies uh, uh, continue to, to decline. And in this slide um, that, uh, uh, that I stole off their website uh, or off their presentation, the, the blue line there is, is, you know, that's domestic water use um, in the county starting back in the, in the uh, 1966, we can see just a huge increase um, in the 90s, you know, when our population, Ottawa County was growing so large um, and so fast uh, that uh, this, this shows the, um, the population demand on just on the groundwater supply. Um, and then the second um, impact, uh, uh, most impacted area is the, the green line, which is irrigation. You know? So whether it's farmland or whether it's uh, um, uh, personal home irrigation, um, it's very significant. So we can't just turn to another source. We'll just go to the ground. I mean, there's some environmental impacts from this draw, this demand, uh, which we fear uh, may impact Lake Michigan um, in the, you know, in the long term. Is uh, um, there's some chlorides that we use, you know, like uh, topographically right now we salt the roads, but there's also chlorides that are that are in the the uh, ground formations. And as we as our demands um, start to, to change those, those flows underground in large quantities and large demands, um, it flows those chlorides and chlorides are not necessarily good for our environment. We don't wanna bring those up um, into the top or drink too many of them. And so uh, environmental effects on the groundwater can happen. We're also seeing um, total suspended solids uh, um, in Lake Michigan uh, start to increase and um, and our plants are all set up to, to mitigate hazards for our drinking water, uh, the environmental impact to, to change our plant to a changing environment in Michigan um, can be very costly and very hard to do. Um, I think that we as a, as a culture and a society, you know, we can do anything. Um, it's just what's the cost. And if we can mitigate some of those, those uh, issues, we can, uh, I think we can save ourselves and our future generations a lot of a lot of issues um, uh, ahead of time. Um, that's all I had, Rose, for uh, for water. Excellent, thank you um, for that information. <clears throat> Excuse me, we'll now turn it over um, to uh, Dave Walters to discuss the BLP's redevelopment, its integrated resource plan and how they support the um, local business community, Dave. 
Okay. Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, my name is Dave Walters. I'm the general manager of the Board of Light and Power here in Grand Haven. And I, I think what I'm, what I'm going to do, do for my prepared time here is just actually share a single slide with you. And it does take a little bit of explanation, but I think it does set the context for the broader discussion. And hopefully it'll spur some discussion, uh, further discussion. Uh, for those of you that are that are on the on the uh, um, presentation from uh, from Grand Haven, you might have seen this before. But let me let me just explain what this slide is, and I th I think it'll set some context of what Grand Haven has done, um, basically in the last five years or so, and what what we plan on doing forward. Um, this chart is uh, is really a I guess it'd be a similar chart to what you'd see in most integrated resource plans for a utility. It kind of shows where we get our energy, and and this is an energy slide. So this is this is the amount of electricity that we're either generating or getting from other sources. And this shows where that collective uh, collective uh, uh, amount is coming from. And if you look at this, um, this goes back to, to 2001. It is on a fiscal year basis. So that's our fiscal year runs July 1 through June 30. So we, we also do this on a calendar year basis. But for the most part, we we do our system planning on a fiscal year so it coincides with our with our uh, electrical report or our financial reporting. So if you look at the top of this slide, the top line on this slide is is essentially the total system input into our system. So um, in any given year, um, approximately 300,000 megawatt hours, or if you deal in kilowatt hours, it's 300 million kilowatt hours are put into our system every year. About 3% of that is consumed in distribution losses and the rest of it's sold to our customers. So um, you can see that that, that 300,000 number, it probably peaked in um, somewhere around 2005. But the first thing that you'll notice is that our sales and our use in Grand Haven, and we do serve both Grand Haven, or we serve Grand Haven and uh, two surrounding townships in the city of Ferrisburg. So they're all included in that, in that amount, but uh, you can see that it's a relatively consistent, not a lot of growth. Actually, you saw some reductions there and then basically a very, very flat, very, very stable uh, load. And you do see that at least in the last year, the impacts of, of COVID, it, it has, has, we've experienced a little bit of a reduction, but actually what we've seen is is residential growth and some commercial industrial reduction. So anyway, again, very stable. Um, during this period of time from 2010 or so, we have been implementing the requirements of the state's uh, energy efficiency program. So again, that's another element that stabilizes this overall growth. So where where do we get where do we get that amount from? So the 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 red portion of this graph is what we have generated locally in in the early 2000s, we had two plants. We had our Sims 3 power plant on Harbor Island in town. Um, that was the uh, our coal-fired facility, about a 70 megawatt coal-fired plant that most people in Grand Haven, if you've been to Grand Haven, have seen it before. So it's out on Harbor Island and it kind of uh, right on the north side of our downtown area. And then we also had a diesel plant um, that's that has also been now closed. Um, that was used quite a bit in the first 10 years of the of, of, of the 2000s and actually also shut down last year about the same time that our Sims plant had. So between those two plants um, in, the, in the period from 2001 to 2010, we pretty much generated all of the power in town. So um, this, is a net, this is a net chart. So it doesn't mean that we didn't buy from other sources, but we generated more than what we bought. So the net result in that period from 2001 to 2010 was that we generated enough to fill all of our needs. And as you'll see in that period from 2010, we actually sold to the market. So we were, uh, we were generating all of our own needs and we were selling about, uh, you know, an average of about 80,000 megawatt hours to the marketplace in that period. And, um, you know, then, then, so, so that's, that's the 2001 to 2009 timeframe. Um, many of you in the sustainable community understand that in 2008, um, the state of Michigan started requiring us as utilities to buy from renewable resources, implement energy efficient pl plans. That's what we've done. And that green, that green line that's now laid across the top, that was this phase in of renewable energy purchases to comply with the state's renewable portfolio standard. 
And how Grand Haven did that is we actually went out through our joint action agency here in the state, a, a, an agency called the Michigan Public Power Agency. We bought with other municipalities from renewable resources and we started doing that in 2008, 2009. And we've bought long-term contracts from landfill gas providers, um, wind, wind generators, and now we're starting to phase in some solar purchases. So that, that green across the top, those are long-term energy purchases. And then that blue that's starting to come in there in 2010, and it goes, and, and it pretty much grows until this past year, the, that blue purchases are what, what we just call a financial transaction or a short-term energy transaction with the marketplace. So we've started in 2010 when our plants became less competitive and other alternative resources on the mark, in the marketplace got less expensive, we started buying from them, all right? So those were under short-term purchases. Again, how we do that is Grand Haven is not what we call it in the industry, a market participant in the marketplace. We do that all through an organization called the Michigan Public Power Agency that is our our, our joint action agency provider. And so all of our bills to the marketplace, all of them come from a single entity, the Michigan Public Power Agency, and they then go out on behalf of their 22 municipal utility members and, and go into the marketplace and they, and they buy from the marketplace. And that's what that, what, that's what that blue purchases coming, phasing in over 2010 to 2015 or so, you start seeing that grow and we started generating less and buying from the marketplace more. Um, in 2015, um, that's the year I actually came here, um, we had invested about $5 million in a major overhaul of our Sims power plant. And we then utilized that plant and tried to give it one last try, I guess, to, 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 to make that economical and, uh, and, and utilize that plant for its remaining life. And then in 2018, we proposed that that plant be shut down in two years, and we put put it, put that plant into a schedule of end of life where we we operated at a lower volume for two years. So now, in where are we at in 2021? In essence, in 2021, we are buying 100% of our supply from the marketplace. About 84% of that is coming in these financial track transactions through MPPA and the other 16% or so is coming through those longer term purchases from, from, uh, from the renewable resources that we've, we have under contract. And that green portion, as you can see, um, it's growing as we go out into 2023, 2024, because we have already purchased further renewable energy purchases that will expand and we have currently planned by 2023 to be in that 25% of our resources coming from, from uh, renewable purchases and the remaining portion coming through this joint action agency uh, that we have in Lansing that's buying from the marketplace. But in essence, what I'm trying to say through all of this is in 2016 and 17 calendar year, we were producing somewhere around the order of 300,000 tons of carbon dioxide um, locally. And in 18 and 19, that went down to about 180,000 tons. And as of today, that amount is zero. So we are out of the generation business and we are depending 100% on the marketplace to provide our power supply and we are, um, working through this agency to, to supply our needs um, that are required. Now, what's this little red slice that's coming in in 2024? Um, that is an amount that we do have. Um, an, one, one other thing that happened here in 2010 is we, we, uh, we hooked up our downtown snowmelt system to our power plant. So in 2010, we not only were supplying electricity to our city, we were also supplying heat to the downtown snowmelt. And that heat for the snowmelt system, we can't buy that from the outside world. So we are now, we've now, uh, as we shut down the power plant, we put some natural gas fired hot water heaters on our system. Um, and we are supplying that, which is not shown on this graph, we're supplying that amount um, from, from those hot water heaters. And um, 
that's a that's a relatively expensive way to generate heat for the downtown snowmelt system. So what we've been asked to look at from the community as a way to to generate a, a bit of electricity as we go forward and also heat, provide heat from a combined heat and power plant. And that plant is is phasing what, what we're looking at doing is is phasing that plan in in 20 in, in fiscal year 2024. Um, and that's what that little red slice is there that um, we would start generating a bit of electricity and generating the heat for the downtown snowmelt system. But you can see that that's only about 5% of our needs. And a lot of people have been asking whether that's economical or uneconomical for us to do that. Um, it is economical for that, that small piece for us to have that, have that, have that, um, that unit there and to also provide backup um, to these renewable and other purchases that we're having. Um, it's not a huge backup, but it, does, it is providing some backup capacity for us to firm up these intermittent resources that we're buying. So that's kind of what we're doing. I, I think the, the end result and what, what, what I would try to say from this, from this is to, as we go into the question period that, um, you know, the Grand Haven Borderline Power, how it's, how it's, uh, how it's meeting its power supply needs is, is actually a transition from meeting those needs itself to depending on the marketplace to, to meet those needs for us. Um, and, and so we are, we are working cooperatively, trying to encourage, um, you know, through MPPA, encourage uh, renewable development in the state by putting a market for it. And, um, you know, we're, we're open and uh, open for business at MPPA, the municipal uh, entities are. A lot of municipalities are similar to Grand Haven in that we don't produce a significant amount of power. So we are currently setting goals to buy more uh, from the marketplace and we're also uh, putting a system in place that will allow our customers to uh, to hook up solar solar roof panels. Um, if we're not generating power, obviously we have uh, we're not we're no longer at odds with our customers if they would like to generate themselves. Um, we want to put a system in place to do that. So that's kind of the business model change that Grand Haven has gone through. Um, there was a lot of preparation in getting to this point. Um, really, really five years ago, we didn't have a distribution system in place. That could uh, that could uh, actually bring in all the power to Grand Haven and not generate. So we've done a lot to uh, rebuild our distribution system, to automate our distribution system, to allow for uh, more distributed energy resources from our customers if that's what they choose to do, and really put ourselves in a position where we can take advantage of this growing marketplace as it develops. So that's um. That's the only thing I wanted to do. I, you know, encourage questions um, and look forward to, to further discussion. Excellent. Thank you for sharing all of that. I appreciate it. Um, can you, uh, before we start into the public question and answer, um, would you mind um, elaborating a little bit more on how the BLP is interfacing with local businesses and if there's any business incentive programs? I'm sure we, um, we, uh, I mean, as far as energy efficiency, um, we're we're required by the state to uh, submit a or, or to have a a energy efficiency program similar to what many people see at Consumers Energy. Uh, we call our program Smart Energy, and uh, that too is again uh, it's done in conjunction with many other municipal utilities in the state. So we have a a common website, a common vendor that helps us with that, and um, we. Are actually required by the state to collect funds from our customers to uh, to perform energy efficiency services, and then we incentivize activity by our customers to you know install energy efficient um, design into their into their operations and and provide them grants and funding to do that. Um, the water utility um, has has actually I think twenty they had twenty thousand dollars not too long ago to put in some variable speed drive in uh, motors. We work with all of our largest customers to, to install lighting programs and that sort of thing. Uh, we've also worked with, uh, we've also worked in the residential community and that, that primarily is through incentives for Energy Star um, appliances and, and, and basically lighting distribution. So we've done those same types of programs that all utilities are required to do in the state. And uh, we, we, we've been pretty effective in, in, in at least, uh, you know, reducing that demand growth that we've seen, you know, previous to those programs. 
And then we also, we, we meet with our large customers, um, our, our 15 largest customers comprise about 30% of our load. And we try to meet with those individuals regularly, um, understand what their needs are from an energy perspective. And quite frankly, they have, they have told us, you know, they, they really, uh, most of our largest customers want us to get out of the energy business and, and to depend on others to do, or out, out of the uh, generation business and, and really depend on the marketplace for those needs. And that's, that's exactly what we're doing. And, and I think that will result in, in you know, more renewable energy purchases as that marketplace develops. And, and those costs are coming down very, very, um, quite a bit. And interestingly, um, MPPA, um, the, the Michigan Public Power Agency just recently, and we've, we were in the paper with this and, and, and our local community understands it. Um, we, uh, MPPA as a whole, just purchased the largest renewable resource uh, or the largest solar resource that is put in in the state to date. Um, it's near Owasso, Michigan, and, um, we, and Grand Haven bought 10 megawatts of solar from that farm. And from, from, a, from a size perspective, you're seeing about five to six uh, acres per megawatt. So that's, that's about uh, 60 acres of solar panels that the BLP just committed to buy um, in, in the recent past, and that's getting phased in, in in 2020. So we're we're buying these large scale renewable investments um, over over the, the 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 last few years and into the next few years. We're also uh, you know and our in our in our companies are asking us to do that because they're all too wanting to be more and more renewable. Excellent. So on that note, um, for your investments in the renewable energy, what, what sort of timeline do you see for that um, as, as, as well as you can? As, as, as far as going forward? Yes. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we, we've, we've placed the, I mean, we've, we've actually put in place that 25% goal by 2022. So uh, the, the state requires utilities right now to be at 15%. So 15% is the bogey right now for, for renewable energy. And, and we're, we're, we're exceeding that at this point in time. And then actually going to 25% under contract by 2022, uh, late 2022, 2023 is when, that, when we'll hit that 25% number. And we're actually evaluating additional purchases. So we, we haven't set you know, a firm timeline associated with being at 30% by 2030. Um, we actually think we'll hit that 30% number by in, in the late 20s, maybe 27, 28, if we continue on our path line. And then what, what I tell people is that's going to depend on the marketplace, how the marketplace develops. We are a market buyer of, of energy. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to probably mirror that, that, um, that, that development. And as quickly as renewable energy people um, can, can bring those resources on, uh, we stand by to buy. Um, and uh, I think... Uh, that's that's really where we've positioned ourselves, and and quite frankly, the renewable community is is doing a really good job um, bringing on new resources. Now, one of the things that has been a challenge in the last several years is wind. Um, wind development in Michigan has slowed to an almost standstill um, because of the opposition that wind developers are seeing in putting in their uh, their energy uh, th th their energy installations. So what we look at from a, from a planning perspective is we look at, um, at, at what's called the MISO queue or, or the, the regional operators um, installation that, that when, when a developer wants to build a particular farm, they need to file for an interconnection permit. We keep an eye on that. And there's literally hundreds of projects in the queue uh, in the marketplace to, uh, to hook up to the system. Some of those will, will be built, some of those won't. But we are we are monitoring that and then buying output from that from the from the projects that we feel will most fit into our portfolio. So um, that's how that's how we're re we're meeting that need. A lot of people are asking why we're not doing it ourselves. Um, there's there's a reason for that. Um, primarily is is that that um, as a municipal utility we can't take advantage of any of the tax credits. So it's really not. Um, it's it's not something that municipal utilities are are good developers of 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 renewable energy primarily because we can't take advantage of those those tax credits that are available to private developers and quite frankly most of the 
the renewable energy projects um, are, are positioned in the marketplace where land is a lot cheaper than where uh, we're then in Grand Haven. So we're really not gonna see substantial renewable development within our service territory. We're gonna to have to look elsewhere um, for, those, for those projects to be built. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Thank you for that information. Uh, we'll turn it over now to some of the questions from our audience. Um, Dan, uh, Daniel Schoonmaker is our executive director for the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum and uh, for the Lakeshore Sustainability Forum. I know you had a couple of questions. Why don't you go ahead and kick us off? You are muted. <laughs> well, at least I'm not green anymore from my understanding. <laughs> the, uh, th 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 thank you, Rose, and I'm, uh, uh, and happy to walk us through the Q and A, a, Q, a Q &A portion here. Looking for thank you both for the for uh, for the information thus far, and uh, uh, really excited to learn more about the future of energy and water in Grand Haven. Uh, David, I think the first questions are going to be going your way, and I say we got about a uh, dozen or so questions that are kind of basic details on the Harbor Island project. Uh, I think kind of my first question there, because because we didn't really share like a specific plan or footprint or, or or much regarding that. How far away is the planning for this right now? Uh, when, when, we, uh, when we shut down and we asked the, asked the, uh, the, our board of light and power in town, which is the elected board that I report to, as well as the city council to shut down the Sims plant. Um, one of the things that they were very concerned about was when we went to this this uh, market purchase type uh, basis, we had strong support from both the board and the council on that. But what they did want to what they did want to see is they wanted to not be 100% dependent on that marketplace, particularly from a backup perspective. So what utilities are required to do is not only buy the energy, but we're also required to buy some backup capacity so that when the wind isn't blowing and the and and, and the sun isn't shining that we as a utility can back that up with some firm resource that can be called upon to dispatch. So when we actually got the approval from city council, they said, they, they, they basically said two things to us uh, in, in December of 2018, they said, hey, we, we would like you to look at making sure that the snowmelt system has a heat source, which we have done. And the second thing that they said is we want you to make sure that you look at backing up some of these purchases with some local generation. And at the time, they, the criteria that they used was about half of our needs, our half of our peak needs, about our average needs that they would like to see backed up locally. So we started a process of looking at that. We started at 36 megawatts and quite frankly, it just didn't make economic sense to build to that level. So that's when we, 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 uh, we scaled down the project to this 12 and a half megawatt combined cycle plant that that we're currently um, planning more for um, in, 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 in the current process. But what the council told us at the time is they would like to see something in, online by June 1 of 2023. So that's the timeline that we've been looking at as being 100% dependent on the marketplace through June 1 of 2023. And then after June 1, 2023 to have some local resources. So that's that's the timeline under which we're, we're proceeding. We're uh, we're actually demolishing the, the Sims plant right now. We're uh, cleaning up the site. Those, those activities are all underway. We're actually looking at, at vacating a significant portion of the Sims site and then using a portion of that site to, to meet those snowmelt needs and then to, to put some backup energy sources on that portion of the island. And that's what you're starting to see in the public. Um, I, I, uh, I, didn't put any any presentation and I'd be happy to talk with any of your supplier or, or any of your uh, attendees more specifically about about those plans. But at this point in time, um, you know, we're looking at moving forward with that. But as I pointed out in my original uh, in my that original slide is that amount of energy that we're going to produce on the SIM site is really it's a very, very small portion. And what people are saying, why bother? It, it's a very valuable. Yeah. Yeah, and if uh, and, and I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, 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 for clarification, so so because a lot of the questions we have here are kind of specific details of of the plan. Yeah. Is there presently a, a plan sure, that I you're can, ready to I, implement? I, I can share um, a 
Let me see if I can. Uh... So like it, like uh, if 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 we were to ask, so like where would gas fired generators be located? What the cost facility was would be? Those are the, the those are the, the, those are questions you'd be prepared to answer at this time. I, and that's what I said. I, I can I can show you a and okay. again I don't want to. I didn't want to take up the entire presentation because I was asked to talk about about right, broadly right. what are what are what are what are uh, what are what our integrated resource plans are, and this isn't really our integrated resource plan. This is a very very small portion of it, but I will uh, I'm prepared to uh, to talk about it. So here. That's not, are you just, that's not really what I. Oh, I am seeing that the. Uh, are you seeing and, my whole screen or just the. Uh, I was seeing the progressive view as a pre presentation. Maybe we will, we'll, we'll table that and kind of look into specific questions. I, well, I was. Let me uh, just, uh, let me just oh, show ahead. you here. Yes. So this is, uh, we, we did hire progressive a &E to look at, at kind of what our needs were for the Harbor Island site. Mm -hmm. And this is the best uh, at this point in time, the best indication of what I can, what I can show you is, is the development for Harbor Island. If you look at this slide, really the green portion of, of this site is about half of our current SIM site and the wetlands area to the, to the south is essentially where our coal yard was. So what this plan essentially does is it says, okay, about half of the SIM site, we are gonna vacate the other half of the SIM site, we're going to put some facilities on that we need um, to, to operate our system and then also set aside some of that property for future needs. So what we currently have is that substation that's shown on this site. That substation was just rebuilt for about $4 million and that's existing. And then you'll see on either side of that substation some space for emerging technologies. And that's really what we're planning long term for batteries. And then you'll see a couple site, a couple portions of there that we see that you see like potential solar, solar expansion. Those two spots are for what we call a solar garden that might that might have some racks put out there and, and the in the public, rather than to put a solar panel on the roof, can put it there. And then you'll also see some building, building and facilities that are constructed on the site. And those are to replace some facilities to replace some of the things that were at were at Sims besides the power plant. And then that number five there is a small combined heat and power plant that we would use to heat the downtown streets and provide some backup generation. So that's kind of that 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 the plan as it states right now. Um, we're currently working with Progressive Annie to further refine that design, and we also have an engineering firm that's that's working now to to, to cost and to finalize the design for that number five on the site, which is this, a small. Uh, small generator and that uh, that whole facility is is sitting within the footprint using the uh, the pilings that are that are that were put on for the sims the sims 3 facility so we could essentially build within the same footprint um, and clearly not as big or as is as intrusive as the as the sims the sims plan is Does that help I think so and I and and uh uh, and for and for 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 clarifications, there there is presently a plan on how to build out the sites, uh, and it is relatively ready to be acted on. Um, yeah, you can, if if you can go on our website, we've actually just created a microsite. It's a uh, Grand Haven Energy, or excuse me, Grand Haven. Well, if you go on our website, Grand Haven uh, GHBLP .org, there's a lot of information there about our planning activities over the last year, and then there's a there's a link to another site that that actually provides additional information that we've mm -hmm. just recently created to to give people more information on what our planning activities are in that regard, and where we stand on it, and what decisions still need to be made, and and how we're progressing towards that that June 1, 20, uh, 2023 uh, deadline that we have. I think we'll circle back with some questions in a second. Uh, first, Derek, uh, ha have a question. Has the city council gotten involved in planning or legislation so far in some in uh, in your work to uh, to mitigate the uh, the demands? Um, no, they haven't. Where staff is still um, is currently uh, developing some of those uh, 
ideas to bring to them for consideration. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's very dynamic and very, um, um, maybe well thought out, uh, you know, um, uh, and so they, they haven't yet. We just experienced last summer, we dealt with the, uh, the shortage or the restrictions uh, and uh, we're doing those this winter. Great. Uh, and, and, and David, I think uh, oh, one question I think I have to ask, and this, this, this is, uh, uh, it has kind of come over, come, uh, come, uh, come in a number of ways, even prior to our, our discussion today, is there, and I think you've addressed this a little bit already in context, uh, there, there is a perception among, uh, among certain facets of the community, and I think this does track to, to some degree along the lines of, uh, of a healthy tension that you'd always see between the environmental interests in a community and the development of new fossil fuels or sites that could, could have better potential uses. Uh, and with that said, there is a potential that this is somewhat, uh, and, and I'm hesitant to use the word controversial, but uh, but is moving forward a kind of three three two board decision and uh, and and uh, there may be some greater opportunity to create a project that is more uh, in alignment with the full community interest. Uh, can you offer kind of any just thoughts on uh, the level of interest in engaging those stakeholders further? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you're you're dancing around a, a question that we've been working for a, a long period of time. I think you're right. Um, I, I, I think what what the community of Grand Haven is struggling with, and I think it's a struggle on, and, and I see tension on both sides. I mean, uh, the, the the people on this call may be more on on the side of uh, of of uh, you know installing renewable energy. There is there is a faction that wants to install. You know more base load type gas gas energy as well, uh, but I think that the real tension from my perspective is we have been a community that has generated the power that it consumes for its entire existence for 125 years, and met most of the 2,000 municipal electric utilities in the country do not generate their power. But Grand Haven is very unique, and that's why I showed that chart up there. It's very, very unique in being in a situation where it has chosen to produce almost all of the power that it sells. That is a very unique situation, and it's quite different than any other municipality in the state of Michigan, except maybe Lansing and Holland, which are much larger than we are. So if you look at any, any smaller municipal utility, they, as the community, have chosen years ago to go to the marketplace and buy their power. Um, I came, I, I was in Zealand for 20 years. We bought almost all the power that we sold from elsewhere. And the only local generation that we had was local backup peaking generation. That concept in Grand Haven is simply not understood because we've never done it before. So when we, when we, talked about shutting down Sims, the first thing that the community said is, what are we gonna build locally to replace it? Whether that's renewable, whether that's natural gas, whether it's something else. And in that environment, what's come about is we're, we're building a very, very small plant and people look at that as a replacement for Sims. Nothing can be further from the truth. That plant is not at all like Sims, all right? So what we're, what we're struggling with as a community is to say, well, if, if that plan isn't replacing Sims, then what is gonna replace Sims? What, what, what local, what local uh, wind turbines are we gonna put up or what local solar panels are we gonna put up? And what our answer is, none. We are not going to do that anymore. We are not going to produce the majority of power that we sell. That decision has been made, solidified by the board and council in this process, and we are not going back. We are not going to go to a situation where we generate the vast majority of our power 
within the city limits anymore. But this conversation that we're having is still, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do locally? What, what solar panels are we gonna put? Even those solar panels, if we line the solar panels and put all solar panels on that entire SIM site, it wouldn't even come close to the amount of energy that we, are, we just received from a remote solar facility. So I think that's the tension that you're seeing. It is difficult because in Grand Haven, we are used to generating our own power. But if you would go to another city, this Traverse City, for instance, is, is very aggressively pursuing renewable programs. They've set very aggressive, um, aggressive renewable uh, standards on their purchases, but they are purchasing it all. They are purchasing it all and they are not as a community paying for and installing solar panels themselves. So I think that's, that's the tension that we're seeing is this idea that Grand Haven, the Board of Light and Power, isn't going out and buying solar panels or buying wind turbines. We are going out and buying a, a small backup plant, but we are, depend, we are actually going to the marketplace to depend, that's, that's where our supply is gonna come from. And, and really, if we could focus on that as a community, rather than focusing on what small generation may be left in the community, I think we would be having a more, a, 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 a more worthwhile discussion that everyone could get behind because no one is suggesting that we aren't gonna go out and buy more renewables. It's just a matter of putting them locally and buying them ourselves. That seems to be the, uh, the discussion that people wanna have. So how, how will the currently proposed uh, uh, gas plant support the, the long-term carbon emission goals of, of customers like Shape Corp and, uh, and the general community interest as well as perhaps the state of Michigan? Uh, will it? Um, I, I think the overall portfolio that we're developing, the, in, the quote integrated resource plan that we, we really should be talking about as a community, that integrated resource plan that we've put together and that will, that will be our, our supply is, is very aggressive. And we're actually in a very unique position. We had a discussion last night about, about or, or Tuesday night, about, about purchasing for the, the city of Grand Haven with Michigan Public Power Agency. And I think our general manager of MPPA put it very, 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 uh, very appropriately is that the city of Grand Haven is quite frankly in a, in a better position than any municipal in the state to aggressively pursue renewable energy because we have just made a big hole in our, our power supply plan. Every other municipality has some fossil fuel in their portfolio that's gonna stay there for five years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, Many of those cities have backup natural gas fired units. Many of them have bought into larger coal fired plants owned by Detroit Edison and Consumers Energy. Grand Haven, to my knowledge, is one of the only utilities that if you look out five years, the only resource that we have hedged out more than five years is renewable energy. So what does that mean? That means that out out five years, we have 25% of our energy purchased and it's 100% from renewable energy. We don't have anything else purchased outside of that time frame, which no other utility could say that. In, in other words, we're 75% unhedged beginning in 2026. And the only thing that we have hedged or purchased is renewable energy. So that presents us a huge opportunity to meet the desires of shape of others to bring in renewable energy, whether that's customer owned generation or generation that's owned by somebody else. So somebody like shape, if they wanted to put a, a, you know, a rooftop solar on a large portion of their facility, we will have a system in place to help them do that. And quite frankly, they will not be stranding any, any investment on behalf of the utility because we don't have any. So this idea that 
building this small plant to back up renewable purchases is displacing future renewable energy opportunities is, is simply not understanding what our, what our long-term integrated resource plan actually is. So I think that's the discussion that we have to have. Um, I'm, I'm, I think as the Board of Land Power, we are trying to get um, a discussion around that issue, but the focus apparently is 100% on 5% of our needs. And we're not talking a lot about 95% of our needs. And that's really where the discussion has to occur. Yeah, and the, uh... David, the, the, we're coming on the end of our time here, and I don't mean to put you in a spot, would you be interested in continuing the discussion if, uh, at, at, a, at a later date? Because it seems like uh, uh, we've got uh, a large number of questions here that are uh, a, a little bit deeper detailed than, uh, than, than what uh, I think we were really prepared to get into today. Uh, I, I do think we, we, uh, we hit kind of the larger the, the, the larger kind of uh, uh, point and intent of the discussion, uh, would you be willing, and, the, and, and I think we'd like to collect uh, the, you know, the 27 or so questions that we have and uh, kind of be prepared to, to, uh, to, uh, to address some of these. Uh, uh, Derek, do you have any, uh, uh, any kind of further thoughts to add today? Oh, you know, <clears throat> we just need to start thinking about our um, our overall energy use and water use. Um, I think that at this point, you know, in our in our society, we, we're we're growing and reaching a point where um, there isn't just the abundance. Uh, having to reconfigure our supplies or the cost to do so um, is very significant. So, um, next twenty years or a couple of decades is going to be going to be very interesting uh, in our in our West Michigan uh, cultures and values. And Derek, thank you so much. The uh, looking forward to having further discussions around uh, around water infra water infrastructure serving the city of Grand Haven. Uh, and David, if if you have some time now, we could start walking through some of these questions. And uh, uh, let, like. let me let, uh, I, uh, let me be sensitive to those people that have to leave. Here's here's my my thought, um, and and I'm more than happy to stay for another hour if that's what people would like to do. I can do that. I know I understand some people need to leave, so. Um, if for those people that need to leave and want their questions answered, they can forward them directly to me. I can give them an email address and we can, we can deal with them that way. And I'll be happy to come back and talk some more to the group if that's, if that's the desire. So I'll give them three options. Um, whatever, is, whatever is the desire of people um, on, you know, on the phone, um, I, I am available for the next hour if that's, if that's what you would like to do. Um, I can... I understand that some people won't be able to do that given the, the the scheduling that we had. So any one of those three is fine with me. Yeah, and the uh, uh, and and I and I like to like to this point give it back to Rose to kind of wrap it up. But uh, uh, just so I don't have folks kind of uh, uh, yelling at me personally. And uh, my name is Daniel, not David, by the way. Uh, <laughs> if you have some time, I love to. Uh, <laughs> I, I would love to uh, to be able to address their to uh, to address their questions if uh, if you don't mind. Sure, let's let's do it. Uh, Rose, go go, well, yeah, go ahead. Sounds great. Thank well, you. Thank you, Daniel um, and Rose, for having me. Um, I do have to head out to another meeting, but uh, if there's any further questions, I've got some Rose forward to me. I'll I'll answer them uh, and get them back to those that ask those. Sounds great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for everybody who was able to join us today. If you are not sticking around, um, we, we really appreciate that you did join us. Um, and if you found our talk valuable today, um, please do consider becoming a member of the Lakeshore Business Forum, um, or sorry, Lakeshore Sustainability Forum or the West Michigan Sustainable Business Member, um, or checking out uh, just our website for upcoming events and other opportunities at wmsbf.org. Um, and please contact us to get more involved with any of the Lakeshore Sustainability Forum or any of our committees. Um, so thank you again for, for joining us. If you are going to stick around, thank you for that as well. Um, and have a wonderful day if you have to hop off. Yeah, and I think what, what, we'll, what we'll plan to do here is we'll transcribe the questions from this point because I think they'll be a little more detailed and uh, plan to send out a transcript to anyone who has left. Uh, and, Perfect. Uh, and, and just, for, just for kind of a point of order, 
Uh, if if at this point, if you ask a question, I'm not we're not going to address it because we've got a pretty long backload of questions already, and uh, we want to be respectful to to everyone's time. Uh, and uh, I think I, I've got I do myself have some time here, but uh, uh, at a certain point, well, I appreciate you. I appreciate you playing David and uh, and and absorbing those those uh, the yelling because I I understand that. <laughs> So, uh, so fire away. Yeah, and it's and I and I think it's an important conversation to have, and to the to the to the ability that we can uh, that we can influence things towards a positive direction. We'd love to play that role here. Uh, and I'm going to start to uh, uh, hopefully with not making it too redundant. Uh, so, is the power purchase from the Miso Power Exchange bought on flat long term rates or on a time of day rates? Do you have the answer so available to that at your fingertips? Go ahead. Yeah, I can I can talk about that. Um, again, this the, buying and selling power is a very complex thing. All right, so um, there's there's several different markets, there's several different ways to purchase, but as far as Grand Haven is concerned, we have one contract with one party, and that's all of our power purchases come from MPPA. So the first thing that you need to realize is Grand Haven isn't going out there and and buying and selling power. Um, we depend on our market participant who was formed for exactly this reason. So what happens with MPPA, what they do is they go out and find counterparties. There's really a couple different ways to do that. If they, if they don't buy forward, any forward financial transactions, the marketplace handles it. So it goes to what's called the day ahead and real time market. So that means one day ahead, and in the real time, we buy 100% of our power. So if we don't do anything else, it falls down to the quote MISO market. And if you can go, you can go online, you can figure out the, the, the hour by hour transactions at what's called the MPPA CP node. You can go on the MISO site, you can see exactly what we're doing. And that, that price that's on there is only if we don't go out and buy from somebody else. So everything that we don't quote hedge if we don't buy from a renewable transaction, if we don't buy these, these forward contracts, then it falls on that day ahead in real time price. All right. So that's, but we only buy about 10% or less of our power on that short term market because that is the most volatile place to buy energy. And some people talk about, about the natural gas markets being volatile. And that's a reason not to get into the gas business. Or, or, or gas generation business, that short-term MISO market is very, very volatile. So what we do is we go out and we find counterparties that we can buy from on a longer-term basis, either monthly or, or annual transactions out one, two, three, four years. And MPPA aggregates all this load together from all of its members, and then it solicits proposals to supply that energy in what we call the bilateral market, all right? That's not what you see when you go on the MISO website and see those day ahead and real time prices. Those are, those are longer term transactions that are bought out into the future from a very specific counterparty, all right? When you buy from the MISO market, you don't know where it's coming from. It's just, it's just MISO is just balancing the inputs and the outputs and they're assigning a price that you pay them and then they pay the suppliers. So that's, okay two completely different markets. I know it's complex, but that is only the energy market. Then you also have a what's called the capacity market that is almost 100% bilateral and it's done outside of that, that marketplace as well. So those are the things that MPPA is trying to buy forward on our behalf and trying to trying to meet our needs. The, uh, and, I, and, and if it's okay, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna ask, maybe, maybe we follow up on this one. Sure. Uh, the, there was a second part of that. Can you make the daily consolidated low curve on the annual peak day as well, uh, as well as the lowest demand day? If that's something you can offer, uh, answer at the top of your head, that'd be great. Otherwise, sure. we follow our, up on our, that. I mean, the bottom line is, 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 is us just like anyone else has a, has a daily load curve that peaks probably one, two o'clock in the afternoon and comes down at night to some level. Our, if you average all of that throughout the whole year, our average load is right around 34 megawatts. All right, that's that 300, 
300,000 megawatt hours divided by 365 days by 24, you'll get 34 megawatts. So on average, we're buying about 34 megawatts on a day like today, you might peak in the, in the 35 to you know 40 range and then go down to 25 at night. In the summertime, our peak load is about twice that average load. So our, this, in the summertime on that peak load day, we're, we're buying about 70 megawatts so when we, when we go out and buy capacity, we have to buy that 70 megawatts of capacity plus, plus what's called a reserve margin. So that peak day, on that peak day with the reserve margin, we're out and we have to reserve capacity a year in advance for that peak day, peak hour, and that's in that 72 megawatt range. Does that make sense? And then this, this, this generator that we're putting in is, is 12.5 megawatts. So that, that, that gives, it's about one third of our average day in about 15% of that peak day. Alan, if, uh, if, if you could let us know if that answered your question, that would like, uh, that, 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 that'd be great. Uh, uh, did, we, did we highlight the, the lowest demand day with that? Yeah, the lowest demand day is going to be a weekend day in uh, yeah. in the valley months, you know, April and in October. Um, we could see loads as low as is 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 22, okay. 23 megawatts on the weekend. So again, that that's that that jumps all over the place. I mean, I can show you a, a hundred different load load duration oh, yeah. or load curves for every day of the year. I, I'm just trying to generalize, but but that lowest hour of that lowest day. Would be a week would would be a weekend day probably a Sunday in April when the when there's not a lot of heating and not a lot of cooling. Uh, Terry Schuster asked a question that I think we've answered already concerning uh, cur current plans to, con to contract for dedicated generation. Sure. Uh, the there's a number of questions concerning the cost of the uh, either the the little red slice or the the the, the generation. Uh, do you, do you have those numbers available presently that you're able to share? So, so the, the cost, and, and again, this gets into the cost of capacity versus the cost of energy. All right. So the cost of capacity is going to be the installation costs of that unit. So these units are recip engines. The cost for installation is about $1,300 a KW. All right. So, so when we install this, these, this cost, a current a current solar facility may be three or four thousand dollars a kW install installed cost. So, but anyway, it then it depends on that's the cost of the installation. So, are these are these rice units, these reciprocating engine units, competitive for the initial installation cost? Is yes, absolutely they are. They are very very cost effective for for installing capacity on the energy side. Obviously, on the energy side, you have to buy the gas, and it, the operating costs are going to be dependent on the cost of gas in the hour that you're running it. All right. So, what we do and how we determine that 5% number is we look at the cost of purchasing gas in that, in that time frame. We set a price for that unit, and then we bid it into the market. All right. And if it doesn't clear, it doesn't run. So the only time that the unit is going to run is when it's cost effective to run. All right. So the people that are suggesting, well, geez, it's not going to be cost effective, then it won't run. If it's cost effective to run, it will run. So people then people say is, well, why would you build it if it never runs? Because we're getting capacity credits for it. All right. So we as a utility have to have this backup capacity available. If we don't put it in, we have to buy it. The cost of buying it is consistent with the cost of installing capacity. Now, what's happened over the last several years is there's excess capacity out on the marketplace. So buyers like us, we don't have any energy, we don't have any capacity, we don't have energy, any energy. So when we go to the marketplace and we want to buy capacity, that capacity cost has been relatively low because there's excess available. People are selling us their excess capacity. 
What happened last year in zone seven, which is the lower peninsula of Michigan, excess capacity went away. There was none. So what, what MISO then does is start charging those people that are deficient in capacity the cost of a new unit, all right? So last year, if we wouldn't have pre-bought our capacity and we would have went to this marketplace, we would have had to pay a higher cost for capacity than what it costs to install one, all right? So, so that's where, that's this, this tension between the capacity marketplace, the cost to install new generation and the energy marketplace. We will always buy from either the contracted energy sources that we have, the renewable energy sources that we have, or the least cost alternative. And if we have a unit sitting there, it will only run when it's cost competitive to run. And quite frankly, that was the problem with SIMS is we ran it when it wasn't competitive to run. All right, we told the, the marketplace, we're gonna run it anyway, even though it's a higher price. We will not do that with a peaking plant. A peaking plant is designed to run only when it's economical to run. All right, that's the difference. As a follow-up question to that, David, as far as interpretation, the, the uh, uh, is it your sense that your your hands are somewhat tied as far as the, the, the uh, the, the need to add this capacity at this time? Um, as, I, as I said, when we got the permission to shut down SIMS, there was a constraint placed on us that they wanted some of it replaced. So the council and the board above us said, we want local generation, all right? We proceeded down that path, all right? and the cost came back that it was a lot more than we originally anticipated, all right? So when that happened, we went back to the board and the council and they said, okay, understand, understand, we do not want to, be, to buy anything that's not cost competitive. So let's see what is cost competitive to build. And that's where we got with the situation that we're in right now. So yes, there was a, there was a requirement that we look at and, and build local generation, but what's happened since is, I think there has been a, a revision in, our, in the constraints placed on me to, to only build what makes economic sense, all right? And that's, that's really why we went from 36 megawatts of installation down to, to, to a much lower level. And primarily the size of that is being driven by the capabilities of supply to the Harbor Island site. The gas supply to the Harbor Island site will only support the 12 and a half megawatts. It won't support the larger unit without a substantial investment on behalf of the city. And that's really where the city now has said, okay, it's really my gas, Michigan Gas Utilities that are driving whether we build any more local generation or not. It's their gas system that is inadequate to support much more. So that's what's forcing us to look at we, we, we've, we've pretty much said this is it anyway, all right? I mean, we're not gonna build any more. We're gonna look outside the city for, for whatever resources that we have because it's really not economical to build gas gen any more gas generation in the community. And it's not really economical for us to put in so large solar facilities or, or wind facilities. So that's what's driving us to, to basically being a market, a market buyer rather than a generator. We just don't we just don't have economical opportunities within our system. All right, that that's reality. Can you talk a little about net metering? Sure, net metering. I I I, I don't want to I don't want to spend a lot about about it. But net metering is essentially an opportunity that the utility provides its local its, its customers in in our circumstance our local customers to generate as what we call in the industry, a distributed energy resource, generate and use power themselves. And then to the extent that they can pump power into the system, um, that we buy that from them and we essentially subtract that amount from the net that they buy, all right? So in other words, they're getting full retail um, cost reductions for every kilowatt hour that they put into the system. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. For the the, uh, to, to, to what extent is it being utilized in in, uh, in Grand Haven at this time? Uh, we currently, um, what, what happened to encourage behind the meter, what we call behind the meter generation or distributed energy resources, consumers in Detroit Edison as utilities were required to provide net metering to their customers up to a certain level, all right? Um, we followed suit. In Grand Haven, we allowed for net metering for residential customers and for business business and, and commercial establishments. We have somewhat of a, a modified net metering where we, we provide a lower cost reimbursement for energy pumped into our system. It's not full net metering, but it's still close. And we never closed it. So consumers reached that 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 two and a half percent or whatever, and they kind of closed it and they changed the, the parameters on what they're doing. We're still, we don't really have a lot of a lot of people in Grand Haven that have utilized net metering, so it's still available to people. And really. One of the things that we as a utility have to do to promote a large, um, a large increase in, in, in behind the meter is we needed to put in uh, a, a automated metering infrastructure or remote meter reading. We had to put, put a better meter on everybody's house. And we just completed that in the last six months. We actually went through our whole system and we were behind. I mean, most people, most utilities have done this several years before, but we have just now completed net metering, uh, or excuse me, uh, automatic metering infrastructure. We've installed a new meter on everybody's house. It's actually a meter that now can support behind the meter generation better than the previous meters that we had. We're also doing a lot for the distribution automation. So distribution automation is really a requirement. It, it's not. It's not a. It's not a rate incentive, but it's a. It's a requirement of the distribution utility. We have to do a lot. To allow for what most people don't understand is you just can't put this meat, you just can't put this 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 uh, rooftop solar panel on on eighty percent of your houses in town and just not do anything to the distribution system. It requires a lot of work and effort and planning to facilitate that, and that's what we're actually focusing on right now. Is we are not focusing on generation; we are focusing on maintaining a distribution system that will allow our, util our, our customers to either buy through us to the marketplace, which we do on their behalf, or put in their own solar panels if that's what they wanna do. We are, I, I use the word agnostic because I'm not, I'm not, I don't know of a better term to use, but we, we don't, at this point in time, we're not, we're not preventing it, we're not discouraging it. We would just as, just as soon have people put rooftop solars on their house their house and generate with them is as we would go out and buy on their behalf. We'll do whatever they want us to do, but we are taking ourselves out of that mix because what we had for the last 30 years is we had a generator sitting here that was generating more than enough power for your needs. And we were we, we were in competition with the local with that rooftop solar because because when you put a rooftop solar panel on your roof, we, we now had fixed costs that we couldn't pass on to you. So we are out of that world now. Luckily, we are out of that world and we are not gonna go back into it. By building this small gas plant, it is not in competition with rooftop solar and it won't be for many, 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 many years, if it ever is. So we actually think the, the, the portfolio that's established from remote energy purchases, Local, local uh, installations of rooftop solar in backup generation at our facility, that combination in combination with potential future battery storage on, on the SIM site, that combination will really present us that future secure energy supply that, that we're trying to promote. And we're trying to do that through every mechanism we know how. To what extent does the uh, does does uh, does the IRP uh, address desires for industry and presumably residential ratepayers to have uh, to have lower rates and uh, ideally more competitive rates with uh, with consumers energy or uh, some 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 of the other municipal utilities in the region? 
Okay, first of all, on the competitiveness of rates, our rates are lower than consumers energy. All right, so um, that's that's not- <laughs> Is that a, um, mis a misperception then among- Yes, completely. It's a complete misperception. I am, I mean, this is not something that we can do here, but if anybody wants any commercial business, any residential business, anyone wants to come in and we will be happy to perform a rate comparison on consumers energy versus the Grand Haven Board of Light and Power, our rates are cheaper in every circumstance with the exception of a very, very large industrial customer that has a very, very flat stagnant load. Because, and the, and the only reason that's the case is consumers demand charges are a lot higher than ours and their energy charges are a lot lower. So for one particular class of customer, a very large, I mean, larger than shape, a very, very large, uh, a pattern with, with a very flat load, which consumers does have some of these customers and that skews their quote industrial average rate down. But those are the only customers right now that we would not be competitive with. But when we did a cost comparison for shape not too long ago, um, their rates, a direct rate to rate comparison on their usage our rates were about 10% lower, all right? So there is a misconception out there. There is misinformation being presented that, that our rates are higher than consumers energy. That's just not the case, all right? Now, what, what is the case is that municipal utilities, statewide, nationwide, have always experienced a rate difference in the positive between them and their private utility partners, all right? So that's, that's commonplace industry-wide, it's about 15%. So if, if you look at almost any municipality nationwide and you say, okay, what's your rates in comparison to your local, your local electric provider, that, that, um, that municipal utilities, that public power utility is gonna be about 15% cheaper and there's a lot of reasons for that, all right? We can talk about that. But, when we compare Grand Haven to other municipalities in Michigan, we are above the, a, the average. So that's what, when people are saying, geez, Grand Haven has quote high prices, they're looking at other municipal utilities and Michigan has 40 of them. And if you take all of the power that those 40 municipals provide and average the rate, Grand Haven is above that rate. All right, so that's that's the discussion. I, I just want to make sure everybody's got it right because there's a lot of misinformation. Grand Haven's rates were higher in that comparison five years ago. So what we did when we were planning on shutting down Sims and we paid off the debt on Sims, we lowered our rates 3% one year, 3% the next year, and then we wrote into our strategic plan that our rates are going to stay constant through this transition. And that's exactly what we've done. So whatever we do, whether we whether we buy it all, whether we, we, we kind of know where the marketplace is right now, we can buy it all and, and, and our rates are adequate to do that. Or we can build this small generator and our rates are adequate for that. There's adequate, what we call debt service coverage margin in our rates to pay for, fully pay for under existing rate structure, this new installation. Or we can just go out and buy it. But it's not a, it's not a uh, if we don't do this, then we're going to have to pay in our rates over here. So it really isn't going to impact our rates that much. So that's the rate comparison that we're doing. And, and, and there's a lot of information out there on it. But I think what people need to know is that really what we're doing in this integrated resource plan is we are bringing our cost of power to the marketplace. All right. That's, that's, that's what we're doing. All right. So it, and it's exactly what Shape and others wanted us to do. They said, you know what? When you generate, your cost of generation is not competitive with the marketplace. We would prefer that your cost of generation be at the marketplace. So the best way to bring it to the marketplace is to actually buy from the marketplace. So that's what we're doing. So all of our, all of our purchases going forward are compared against the marketplace, but that what the risk is for the community then is as, as the marketplace goes up, our rates are gonna go up with the marketplace because that's where we're buying our power from. Does that make sense? 
the uh, the an, a num there is a number of questions about the siting of the Harbor Island uh, the 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 planned the planned uh, new Harbor Island facility and uh, uh, characterize those as the historic the it seems that there's no longer a a business reason to have it located on the lake shore and there may be some preferable use for that sites as opposed to say other commercial other available industrial property uh, and the second part of that question the to what degree is the facility prepared for for flooding which has is somewhat common on harbor island and uh and i think i'd add to the degree that you've factored in uh climate change scenarios and high water and so on and so forth within that well, the first one, the flooding, the flooding question, we've actually answered this on our website, so you can go there and look at it. But not too long ago, we had a we had a letter to the editor written in our local paper that said, geez, go look at these website, go look at this web, this FEMA website. Um, this FEMA website has been updated, and now the SIM site, which was never in a flood zone before, is now in the flood zone because these these FEMA sites have been updated and now. They're saying because of climate change and all that other kind of stuff, we're in the floodplain. So what did I do? Went and looked at the website that was referred to in this in this uh, in this uh, in this editorial, and sure enough, we're not in the floodplain. We're not in the 500-year floodplain. We're not in the 100-year floodplain, and it is actually well above the floodplain, and we have no flood issues. We haven't had flood issues for the last 60 years in the footprint of the plant. And we don't plan on having any flood issues going forward. Now, to make that even to, to solidify that point even further, is we are now designing the facility. And one of the things that we're required to do when we design a new facility is we have to set a floor elevation on that location. And we know we now know the floor elevation on what we're going to do. And if 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 I remembered exactly, I could tell you the floor elevation, but if you look at that floor elevation that we're building at and saying, okay, where does that sit in relation to sites all over Grand Haven? We will have hundreds of properties in Grand Haven underwater before they reach that, not underwater, but their, their floor elevations will be flooded before that that site is flooded. So that site, and what we did a few years ago is we actually in Grand Haven looked at quote flood sensitive properties. And we identified hundreds of sites in Grand Haven that were flood sensitive properties. That site is not one of them. All right. So I think what we need to do in this discussion is we need to look at these documents that people are referring to us to and then look at them, but we cannot build in a floodplain, all right? We, there's there's no way, we couldn't have built it. We built the, we couldn't have built Sims originally in a floodplain and we can't build its replacement facilities in a floodplain. So that that argument is is somewhat um, lost on, on what the actual information out there is. So the floodplain issue, I think we've addressed. The other question that you had now I've now I've lost track. What was the other non-floodplain question there? Is if the uh, is if there might be a preferable use for that site? Okay, underwater. preferable use for that site. All right, um, that's a really good question. We uh, we actually um, what most people don't know is um, we actually solicited and 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 contracted with private developers before we started looking at uses for that site ourselves, or at the same time. So we have actually had developers, one of them signed a contract for six months to come in and look at alternative uses for that site. We have looked at alternative uses of that site. We have also looked at vacating that site. The problem with doing that is one, is there interest in putting something else there? That's the first question. Are, are there any real interest in putting something there? And secondly, what would it cost for us to vacate the premise, all right? So those two questions, we have done a lot of investigation on. The, the second question, what would it cost to move off the, that site? Think about this in that, in that graph that I showed you originally. That site 
was the center of our distribution system for the last 60 years. That means every line, every high voltage line coming into that site and every distribution line coming out of that site was built for the power in the Grand Haven community to come from that site, All right? That's our whole distribution system. So just shutting down the power plant didn't change that. All of the lines in the greater Grand Haven area, now we have two other substations as well, but those primarily serve our industrial park and the areas to the north of the north of, of the river. So all of the all of the lines that serve the city proper come back to that site. Now it is not inexpensive to move that substation from that site to somewhere else. And where would that be? All right. So we 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 do have kind of examples of how that's done. Um, in, in Holland and Grant and in Traverse City, they've shut down their facilities and kind of relocated their distribution system around it. In Holland's circumstance, they left the substation right next to the power plant. They didn't try to do that, all right? In Traverse City, they spent a lot of money to actually enclose and buy a building and put their substation inside a building in the downtown area. That's probably the most expensive distribution substation in the state of Michigan. Now, if I can get 10 acres somewhere in the downtown area, west of 31, to locate a substation and reroute all of those lines, I can vacate that premise. But until we do that, and we looked at it, this is one of the things we had Progressive A&E look at from a master planning perspective. So we looked at it, it was very, very expensive. So the board said, rebuild the substation on site. So we just spent $4 million rebuilding that substation on site and it isn't moving. All right, so this idea that we're going to completely vacate the property is 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 that decision is done. It's gone. We're, we're going to stay there. And we're going to put the sub keep the substation there. So the next thing is is okay. Can we vac can we vacate some portion of the site? And we're saying yes, we can. We can vacate half of it. So we've we've said we're going to vacate half of the premise. We're going to work with with the with the, the city, everyone else to, to, to make that something that they want it to be. So we've already committed to doing that. The other area that we're staying on that has the substation on, people are saying, well, is that too big? Is that too small? That particular piece of property is heavily contaminated, all right? So for us to make it available for somebody else, it will be very, very costly and we will still retain the environmental liability. In other words, we know we are going to have wells on that site for a very, very long time monitoring the contaminated groundwater on that site. And if there's anything that develops in the next 30 years, we're gonna have to go in there, clean it up, move who's ever there out of the way and clean it up, all right? We have bought that scenario. So what we're saying is, the best people to stay there, monitor it, whatever, are the people, are the utility. We can use that property cost, cost effectively because it is very valuable to us. It is the center of our distribution hub and it's the best environmental cleanup use to use it for utility purposes. That decision was made and, and we've determined it in several different ways that the highest and best use for that that remaining property, that 10 acres to 12 acres of property that we're retaining, we've determined it several different ways that the highest and best use are for us to stay there and us to use it. Now, there are people out there that think that think there's just incredible interest from whatever parties that they want that to come in there and build it. Quite frankly, I've talked to some of them and after they understand the environmental problems, they don't want to have anything to do with it. So this idea that this is a great site for alternate development, it's simply an idea from people that don't understand the problems with redeveloping the site. The other thing that people need to understand is the utilities to that area are very, very expensive to build. In other words, we're going to spend almost $800,000 extending water and wastewater to that site. The water and wastewater, the water alone, the, we, we only have wastewater service to that site today 
60 years old, it's old and it needs to be replaced. We have never had wastewater service to that site. So the wastewater, the wastewater redevelopment is very, very expensive. And quite frankly, we are the only ones that value that property that much to, to want to put that kind of investment in. So there's a lot of reasons. Again, these are all the reasons that Progressive A&E went through it's very sequentially. They went through and they said, okay, how is wastewater being managed here presently? Is that septic? We have a, we, we, we only have, we only, the only wastewater that we have on site was the bathrooms in the facility. And we had a, a on-site treatment facility that was licensed. It was essentially a, you know, a, yeah. a, a small wastewater <laughs> treatment facility, similar to what you'd see on a campground or something like that, but that yeah. would never support any kind of any, and that's now been demolished. All right. So, okay. So, so that's 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 that wastewater redevelopment cost. The uh, uh, care to care to talk about electrification at all? Is that has that factored in your plans, either in context of the new development or just in general with the IRP? Electrification of vehicles is that what you're, you want to talk about? I think is we're talking that, about that? electrification in a general sense, probably okay. more electrification of homes. So uh, okay, moving, yeah. moving towards a net right. zero environment. Sure. Um, so anyway, electrification for the most part is two, there's two components to it, all right? The first one is, is distribution related, all right? When if, what most people don't realize is if everybody starts hooking up a, an electric car to their home, our, di our current distribution systems are not adequate for that, all right? So. We need, we need to be able to provide, that's like putting three or four extra homes on every city block, all right? Our, our distribute, and, and if they start heating with all that, you've got larger transformers, you've got larger conductors, you've got larger substations. If you looked at our projections going forward, and this is where the utility industry doesn't really coincide with some of these projections that people have for electrification, because our distribution systems are just not sized for substantial electrification efforts that some are talking about, all right? So that's the first thing. So what we're doing, again, we're focusing our attention on distribution and getting away from the generation portion, all right? So we are currently involved in a very significant rebuild of our distribution system. It has not been, I mean, I mean our assets are old, they're end of life, they're not, they, they don't use current technologies. So we're in the process of spending a lot of money, which will allow for increased electrification. One of the things that we did before we shut down SIMS is we improved the interconnections to the grid. A few years ago, we did not have a grid interconnection sized adequately to ship all the power in when SIMS wasn't operating for our current load. You expand that current load, we needed a lot larger interconnections. We've done that already. We spent seven, eight million dollars improving all of that, what we call our sub-transmission system and all the interconnections to the grid. So we've, we're have we preparing for more electrification. Now it says, okay, well, what are you doing from the supply side of things? And again, our integrated resource plan going forward is to buy it from the marketplace, all right? so. To support electrification, we as a state are going to have to install a lot of new generation, a lot of new renewables, a lot of other things. We are depending on the marketplace, just like everyone, every other customer in the state is. And quite frankly, if you look at, at Consumers Energy and Detroit Edison's integrated resource plans, they were being told to depend on the marketplace more. In other words, the the renewable energy developers in the state would prefer to develop that energy themselves rather than have the utilities generate it. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're saying, okay, you guys want to generate, you guys want to have you 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 renewable developers want the want to provide into the system. We're going to give you an opportunity to do it. The uh, would would you either presumably not as an alternative to to the uh, to to the to the natural gas power plants, but as a complement to it, but perhaps in some scenario an alternative would would the BLP entertain uh, a third party solar development or 
perhaps even a community and a community solar project similar to like what uh, what they have in Traverse City with the uh, uh, with Cherry City with Cherryland. Cherryland, um, yeah, sorry. I, that's that's actually what we're talking about on the on on Harbor Island. Again, we're going to dedicate some property out there. Um, actually, that's a really good use for contaminated property. By the way, I mean landfills are an untapped resource for uh, for for community gardens such as this. We we've, we've looked at several of them. Um, it's it's cheaper land. Um, it's a good place to put to put uh, solar panels. Um, we're we're entertaining that, but I I really think that probably from the most part, you know, what Traverse City did with Cherryland is a perfect example. They didn't put that in the city of Tra Traverse City. It, they put it out out in the in the rural areas outside of town, and they did it in conjunction with their rural electric cooperative next door, so that the property. I mean, the Grand Haven is not a good place to put solar in any kind of solar garden, any kind of solar large solar facility. The pro, the price of property in in within the city limits of Grand Haven and within primarily within our service territory is really not a good location to do that. We would be happy to entertain it, particularly if it was in conjunction with other municipalities, that, that's exactly what we're encouraging, but it's not gonna be in the city limits of Grand Haven. I mean, that's just, that would be a really poor location for it. And it would really be, wouldn't be cost competitive with putting it somewhere else. So, I mean, I think that's, plus, I, I think what some people are finding when they look at, at the placement of solar, there is such a difference in capacity factors, and there is a difference in capacity factors, um, right along the coast of Michigan, where where it's cloudy more often. And I, I, I did the commute between West Michigan and Lansing every day for five years. I know what happens when you drive 20 miles, 20 miles, uh, or or in Grand Rapids further to the east, the clouds clear up this time of year, and there's sun out there. And I will assure you that the capacity factors and the output of solar facilities east of Grand Rapids will be noticeably different than west of Grand Rapids. I mean, that's just, um, I, I think that's that's a given. And I, I think when we wanna invest our customer's money and our money, we wanna invest it most in, in, the, in the best places possible. Yeah, and it does, and, uh, and, to, and to clarify though, there, uh, there, there is, there is active consideration to invest in some projects similar to that as a means to diversify the portfolio, especially if that could happen in, on more marginal lands. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, we the only thing that we've bought in the last two years long term is solar. And, and um, you know, so we, we've actually contracted for 14, about 14 megawatts of solar. That's a large. That's a large component of solar. That's um, you know, multiply that times five or six acres. That's 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 how many acres of solar panels that we've already contracted for, and we are contracting for more going forward. So we we have every desire to roll. And and, and quite frankly, it's cost it's cost related. Those solar facilities are now very competitive with any alternative, uh, you know, resource that we're we're buying. Um, the problem is they don't come with much capacity. So that's actually why when you pair solar with a capacity resource, that is the most competitive product that we have in the marketplace right now. And But whether that's a battery or whether that's a peaking facility, that's really what we have to wrap our hands around. But the marketplace is not recognizing battery as, as capacity at this point in time. So we have a problem as a utility or as a customer of how we get capacity when we buy solar energy. And, and that's something that's gonna be solved in the next few years. It won't be solved 100% by batteries for those people that think that, it will not be. Um, so there will be a need for some peaking type generation, probably long-term from hydrogen, all right? That's where, that's where people that, that, that are doing a lot of research right now we need some peaking generation on the system from a non-carbonless source, else we aren't gonna get there. So I think what we're doing is we're watching the marketplace, we're developing developing you know, resources in reaction to it. And, and I, I, I hope, 
I hope just like everyone else does that we'll have an opportunity to buy those resources. Well, David, uh, uh, I think that gets us through uh, uh, our backlog of questions here. Thank you for taking our extra time today and sitting on this uh, 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 unexpectedly marathon discussion. Let, the, let, me, uh, let me ask, I, I did see one other question and this is one that comes up regularly and, and I think- The snowmelt I, question? Well, no, it's not a snowmelt question. It was, okay. it, it was about the size of our investment, all right? So okay. when people see the size of the investment that we're talking about at Harbor Island, they go, how can that possibly make sense? First of all, the, the $45 million number that you're seeing for redevelopment of the Harbor Island, a lot of that is demolition, substation, environmental cleanup, all that stuff is in that number. So when you look at the generation component of that, of that project, it's about $17 million, right? $17 million for a heat source, a heat source for our snow melt and some backup generation, all right? So that's, that's the number that we're looking at, that, that $1,300 a KW range plus some snow melt equipment that's, that's, the, that's the number that we're looking at for generation investment on the island. Now, people say that is a lot of money. That's a lot of money, right? And I agree, $17 million is a lot of money. But what Grand Haven is going to spend over the next 20 years on its power supply portfolio is something on the order of $425 million. So we're talking about $17 million dollars out of $425 million that we will be spending on, on power purchases over the next 20 years, all right? That's the context. That's why I put up that slide. I said, but, but when people see $17 million, of course, that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. Now, when they say, okay, well, now why do you need to build this, this office facility? You know, why is, why is that, you know, five to $8 million or whatever? Why do you need that? Well, we had office facilities at, at the SIM site. People, we had 35 workers at that site. And one of the things that we've been doing as a utility, as we have been, contrary to what's been happening <laughs> over the last couple of days when people shut down, you know, fossil fuel type facilities, they lay people off. We have laid no one off in our transition, no one. And we're relocating those people into the jobs of the future, which are distribution related and we need a place for them to be put. So part of our revenue source for the next 35 years is in administration, is in building, is in facilities to house the people and our control and our new control room for our distribution system in a facility. Now we have to put that facility somewhere and people are saying, well, why don't you put it here? Why don't you put it there? Why don't you put it here? whatever, we have now then put that on the SIM site, on that property that we are redeveloping because that is the most cost-effective place for it to put it. So we have done this analysis. We're happy to share it with people. We've done all the analysis. We, we aren't building luxury apartments or anything like that or, or offices. We are building a utility functional office building on the front of a combined heat and power plant and that's the project that we're looking at doing there. And quite frankly, it is as costly or cost effective as doing it anywhere else, with the exception of those, of those, of those utility connections, those that sewer and water connections that we're talking about. That quite frankly, the only reason we're spending that money is because we are staying on that site and on, for other reasons, and that's justifying us putting in that money. But other than that, there is nothing else where you where we're using the foundations that are there. We are economically as economically as possible building those facilities, and that's just not that's just not getting out. It's it, it's being distorted in whatever people are saying, and we are not spending any money unwisely. We report to public boards that are very very um, conscious of our costs. We aren't throwing money away. We aren't doing things that people are claiming we're doing. We're just rebuilding some of the facilities that we lost when we tore down the SIM site. So that's, that's that cost area. We think if, when, when, all the when, when, all the when all the costs are laid out on the table and evaluations are done, the other thing that on the snow melt issue that you, you, you've, you've raised is snow melt was predicated on combined heat and power. 
All right, so when we installed Snowmelt in 2010, it was predicated on using waste heat, all right? We invested, it was before my time, but we invested $3 million in pipes in the ground and we predicated that operational cost on using waste heat, all right? That's what the merchants were given as costs. That's what everybody planned on doing is using waste heat, which is a whole lot cheaper than burning gas, heating hot water, and, and putting it in those pipes. So right now in the interim, we've put in gas hot water heaters. We are burning gas to produce heat to melt snow. That is a very, very expensive interim solution. So what council, what the downtown merchants and what others have asked us to do is they have asked us to look for a more efficient way so that we can get the benefits of combined heat and power. In other words, generate electricity and generate heat together is cheaper. And if we're using natural gas to heat the streets, let's take that natural gas rather than to heat the streets with it, let's put it in an electric generator, get electricity and heat. Now, in any- Can you clarify the waste? Then, you, you mentioned waste heat earlier was the original intention. Yes. What was the waste heat uh, a derivative of? The operations of the Sims plant. Okay. All right, so so what in a coal-fired plant, it, it, we don't have to get too technical, but it's it basically you have, we're bringing in river no, I, water. I just wanted the clarification. River water, we use the yeah. heat and we exhaust the river water. So before we exhausted the river water, we put it through the, through the downtown snowmelt system and all they paid for was the pumping costs and some of the heat, you know, you know, to the extent that we had to put more heat in from time to time to heat the water up further, they paid for that cost. That's how, that's how the cost was predicated. Right now, the costs are predicated on putting gas into a hot water heater and heating the water to the level needed to melt snow. Now, luckily this winter, we haven't had a lot of snow to melt. But I'm telling you, if we stay in that, we stay in that avenue that we're in right now, our downtown merchants are going to get killed. And that's the solution that no one out there, no one out there is saying anything about. Everybody's saying, oh, no, no, we, we can just stay doing whatever we're doing right now. We can just use gas to heat the hot water and put it in the streets. No one, no one has come up with a better solution. And quite frankly, I looked I talked to other people that had these, you know, other sustainable ways to produce heat. We looked at all those alternatives and they weren't costly. I mean, I actually even had somebody talk about using the waste heat from the sanitary sewer to heat the downtown. We looked at all kinds of alternatives. They are simply not cost effective. So the only cost effective way that we know of to meet the, the snow melt needs and it, we're not building a plant just for snowmelt. We're building a plant for electrical needs that doesn't cost the that doesn't elevate the cost of the electrical users, and it can be used to reduce the snowmelt costs of the snowmelt users. So that's it, really what that's something tough. that the the utility is doing that no one else out there is doing. No one else is trying to find a snowmelt solution. That and if we don't meet that snow melt solution, we're gonna have $3 million of pipes in our downtown district. Not, right. it's not gonna yes, work. Cost. Yeah, the, uh, as a clarification, cause, cause I think there's some, uh, uh, that there's, there's the impression uh, that, that the plant will only be running to, to meet, to meet capacity, to meet capacity uh, when needed. The, uh, is that an accurate understanding or will it need to run to power the snow melt system regardless of where demand is at any given point? All right, so so when, when we talk about backup on the system, all right, th there's really two different things that I'm talking about there. One of them is a, a resource adequacy requirement, emergency requirement. So what MISO does when, when, when um, all its uses are lined up all the way, they just put out a blanket call and they say, Everybody that's dedicated capacity, run it and, and, and put everything into the grid that you possibly can, all right? So at those times, of course, those units would be running, all right? Now, any other, so, so that's kind of that, 
peak hour, everything's online. We need your service. We put out a blanket call. They will reimburse. Then MISO will reimburse our costs of running that unit. All right. So if, if we're called upon, but what in essence, what it's going to do is just offset our load on the system and our resources that we've currently bought to come to our system will go somewhere else. All right. So we'll get, we'll get reimbursed for the cost of operating our unit in those circumstances. The other circumstances, the rest of the year, we will dispatch that unit economically. All right. So what that means is every day before the day before auction, there's a day before, you know, schedule, we bid into the market. We say, this is the cost of running that unit. All right. And we will then be run called upon to run whenever our unit is our, our unit offers expected. Now we think that's that 5% number. All right. Now the other time that what we'll do in the winter time is we will actually figure out the cost to put gas in. We, we, we still have these hot water heaters, right? So we can determine the cost of putting gas in those hot water heaters. And then we can determine the cost of generating electricity with gas. And we can, we can now bid a lower cost to generate electricity because of the savings that we get from avoiding the gas purchase for the hot water heaters. And we can put that price into the marketplace, all right? Now we feel in that particular circumstance, we will be running one or two small engines throughout the winter time because they will clear and they will run to produce heat for the downtown merchants at a more economical price than buying the electricity and buying the natural gas. That combined heat and power application will be cost effective during most of the winter time. So then, so that 5% that we're talking about is three or 4% is, 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 is utilizing those units for that combined heat and power application. And the other one or 2% is for using the units to peak shave our highest costs and to bring on and support the, the system when they need all of those units. So that's, that's how that, and, and quite frankly, they are not in competition with re renewable energy. They are not displacing any renewable energy during those times, none, zero. They are not in competition. They are in a completely different marketplace, all right? So the, the, the suggestion that it's a choice between this unit and renewable energy, it's not understanding the dispatch of that unit and when it will be put online because at, at no time are we ever going to be displacing renewable energy that's put on the grid, that's taken first, all right? That's dispatched first, automatically, we take it all. Um, so, so in no circumstance is that unit in competition from a price with renewable energy. That's just, that's just the way the system works, all right? So there's a lot of misconception out there about, about, about that we're displacing renewable energy, that the cost is higher than renewable energy, that the, that, that the and, and all of that really stems from a lack of understanding of how, the, how this unit is going to be dispatched. And it will only be run when its costs are cheaper than the marketplace. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, definitely does, Dave. The, uh, I don't want to, uh, I want to be careful. I understand your answer. I want to be careful not to necessarily endorse the plan and I, I'm not um, asking for any endorsement. <laughs> yeah. In fact, if it's so, spurs, if it, if it I'm spurs trying to be careful of the way I uh, way way I vocalize my affirmation there. <laughs> if if it, I just want to know if it makes sense. All right. I mean, I, I think from my perspective, what we need to do as a community. It does get, to me, yes. But get but off please the finish. rhetoric. Get off the rhetoric and get on the real analysis. And when we look at the real analysis of what's occurring. The board is the board is asking me, and the council is asking to me, to provide cost-effective solutions. And th there is no way, there's no way that the board or council, even even a simple majority of them, are going to want to build generation in the in the city of Grand Haven that does not make economic sense, and that I that we cannot prove it. That is that. I, I think I think our our entire board, our entire council, is 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 not being um, 
adequately portrayed there. There's no way that any of them want to build anything that doesn't make economic sense. And it's not going to be utilized and it's going to strand costs and all this other kind of stuff. I, I think that's, that's simply not the case. So um, going back to your original question, no one is pressuring me that I know of to build something that doesn't make economic sense. But this idea that running a unit at only 5% cannot make financial sense, that is simply nonsense because there are a lot of resources in the system today that run less than 5% of the time that make economic sense. There's all kinds of resources. Um, there's, there's all kinds of resources out there that were built for these peak periods of time that were generated on the capacity markets that are being built and they're still being built, all right? They're still being built for that purpose. Batteries will be installed for that purpose. There's a lot of money being sp spent to meet those peak demands of the system that, um, that do not result in significant energy production. Yeah. All right. And so, uh, and I, I think I should clarify, I, I, I don't think I had asked if someone was pressuring you to, uh, to build something that wasn't feasible. I was just looking for clarification on the, the, the understanding. Between well, I, think, I think, I think yeah. some, I, I think the question comes about by that, that direction to that council made to build something. Um, I think they backed off from that. And, and, and now what they're saying is, is, is come back with a, with a, uh, a solution that will meet the snow melt needs, provide some backup needs to the community and make economic sense. And that's where we're at today. All right. So that, that's really mm -hmm. what, I mean, I, I, whether pressure is the right word or not. Um, I think, I think that is where we're headed as a community is to try to get those needs met in the, in a cost effective manner. And that's what the board and council interests are in this regard. And then, uh, Dave, I guess just to wrap wrap up here, and again, thank you for taking the time today. The uh, as a yes no question, because I think it comes up, it's coming up a couple of times in the chat here. Uh, is it it uh, based on your present uh, present understanding and all the research you've done, supported by Progressive AE's analysis and outreach to other other developers? Is it uh, is it is it feasible to bid for that property to be available for alternative development? Um, at this point in time, uh, what, what has to happen for that property to be available for alternative purchase, and this is the same thing that we're dealing with on the diesel plant site right now, how the BLP rids itself of property is a two-pronged approach, all right? The first thing that the utility has to do for that property is deem it, quote, unnecessary, right? So there is no property that will be, quote, made available, no utility property that will be made available for alternative development if the Board of Light and Power does not deem the property unnecessary, right? In the diesel plant circumstance, the, the Board of Light and Power has deemed that property unnecessary and it's going through the process of selling it and making it available for other purposes, all right? On the SIM site, the Board of Light and Power specifically said, we need at least half of this property, all right? So they've already made that determination. So half of the property is needed, has been, has been deemed, quote, needed by all five board members, all five of them. No disagreement whatsoever. And quite frankly, if I think we ask council, I think we will have a, at least a majority suggesting that as well. So for half of the property on the SIM site, it is quote, not available at this point in time for any alternative purposes because they have not made that determination. On the other half of the property, what we're saying is, is we do not need that property for utility purposes. So at that point in time, it is going to go through a process of what is the best purpose for that site. And quite frankly, I think it's going to be deemed only appropriate for some public use conservation because there's contamination there. There is um, probably wetlands mitigation requirements 
there are a lot of things that are going to stand in the way of alternative development on that on that other half that um, that no one has come up with a solution for. And I think at this point in time, we're progressing down the path of, of, of putting wetlands, mitigating wetlands in that area, and then turning that site over to somebody else for their, and if we put wetlands there, there will be no other use for that property because then that wetlands will come with a development restraint that says you can't put anything else here. So again, we are open as a BLP in the, whatever alternatives they want to use on that other portion of the site. But I think what we're going to find is, is that there will be constraints on the development that will probably limit it to some sort of, um, you know, non evade, you know, non use public, you know, and, and what we have on portion of that site right now is an area called linear park, linear park will probably be expanded into the wetlands and there'll be some sort of, as, as I showed on that diagram, some sort of, um, and I know that's not a yes, no answer. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it, it, it's it's hard. It's it's complicated. All right. So anyway, I understand the uh, uh, like uh, 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 it can be difficult to uh, to uh, to distill things there, and they don't want it to be uh, misinterpreted in a way that could create additional questions as a result. So speaking of uh, additional questions, Dave, uh, do you mind letting us know the best way? How would you like anyone who has additional questions to contact you? What would be what would be ideal for that? Um, I, I I understand that some people are hesitant to call me directly, so we that's fine. Um, we have some board members that have stepped it up and said we'll answer questions. Uh, we don't have are you email. okay with somebody contacting you? I've just gotten a couple of emails asking if they could have your direct email. Um, and sure. I just wanted to uh, okay sure they, you can give them my email. Um, and, and if I can't answer the question, I mean, I think Eric Booth might still be on the call, maybe not, but he's okay. the guy that's um, and, and we'll get it, we'll get answers to your questions. You can either go and you can also go on our website and just pose your question on our website. Okay, and we'll try to. Uh, there's an area of the website, uh, the new, the new uh, website that you can put a question on there and we can answer it. Um, you know, we, um, the easiest way to ask me a question directly is just put it, put it in an email and I'll, and I'll answer it as quickly as I can. Sounds great. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I, and I think it is my understanding that you're having that, that you've been open to having meetings with stakeholders throughout the community and have a, have a slide deck that you've walked through yeah, well, discussions with folks. What, what we've, what we've done is we've, um, be, because, Really, we lost the messaging for a while, and I, I think, admittedly, we have. Um, and and that loss of messages has been filled by a void. So what we're trying to do is is recreate um, recreate you know information in an understandable fashion. So we've we've redone our website. We've got a lot of information out there. The first thing I would do is encourage people to use that website. We're putting more information out there every day. Um, and, and, and I think you're, you're going to find a lot more information over the next three or four months as we as we gain more knowledge on what we're proposing and, and exactly what it looks like. We encourage the public to go onto that website. Um, direct con, but but what we found also is direct content. I mean, some people don't they 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 appreciate the uh, the the uh, the direct contact. So we've we've set up about forty or fifty direct meetings with people. Um, decision makers, opinion, opinion leaders, whatever you want to call them. And we have split those people up amongst our staff here, board members, and we're meeting with them, going through a portion of the slide deck that's on our website and, and sharing that information with them. If anybody, if anybody on, on this call wants us to do that with them, I would be more than happy. It takes about 25 minutes to a half hour to go through this eight slides that we're talking about. And then if they want additional questions, we're more than happy to, to do that for you. But the first start is probably just to go to our website, look at it. And, and if, if, if something needs explaining there, we're more than happy to, to do more. Well, again, thank you, Dave. And okay. thank, thank you for, thank, thank you to those who stuck, who stuck, who stuck around with us. I hope we were able to, to answer uh, all, all of your questions today. And the, uh, uh, and I really appreciate the flexibility, David. I know this was uh, more than I thought you're more than I think you uh, had expected to kind of bite into today. 
but uh, I, I think we appreciate the opportunity to get the information out there and uh, ho hopefully to the degree we can uh, clarify some points and uh, it, the, the awesome project may not be to uh, to everyone's ultimate vision of you know how quickly they would like to like to see uh, to see fossil fuels go entirely away but uh, uh, it, I, I hope we've taken some good steps to uh, to improving the dialogue around it. And and I appreciate everyone that participated as well. Um, I think we do want to encourage a, a I, what I'll call a more civil dialogue, um, and 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 hopefully you know breach some of these subjects. I think I think it is it is important that everyone kind of understand the process that we're going through. Um, I think a lot of what has been done by the BLP in the last year and a half, two years, has been somewhat misconstrued. Um, and, and, I, and I think I think we need to have a, a, a dialogue about how Grand Haven is going to uh, you know meet these needs. And by us going out and buying power, it's it's not a decision to avoid any any element of that developing portfolio. We we want to encourage all of those uses. In fact, I've probably talked to more solar and wind developers in the last five years than anybody on this call has. So um, I, I mean, we encourage their development. We want to buy from, from new developments in the state. We want to encourage a healthy, um, renewable uh, and, and sustainable uh, generation uh, resource for the state of Michigan. And we're doing everything that we can to support that. Um, I, I, if, if anything else is being said, um, that's simply not true. Um, if, if, we're, if, if anything other than that, we are, we are supporting the efforts in every way possible because we are the ones that are the beneficiary of, um, of lower cost, clean, renewable energy because we have the biggest hole in our portfolio than any other utility in the state as far as I'm concerned. So I'll leave it with that. Thanks again for everyone. Um, I appreciate it. And I appreciate Daniel, your, 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 your uh, efforts to go through those questions and pick the ones that and blend them together because I know that that's not an easy thing to do as well. That's what we're here for, and, I, and again, appreciate appreciate your time and appreciate the uh, the 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 involvement and, and in many cases civic engagement of of those who are uh, uh, who have stuck around with us today. All right, thank you. Thank Thanks you. So much.